All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to our virtual Zoom event, Ask the Doctor, an update on COVID-19 with Dr. Rob Murphy. I'm Catherine Oline, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris. The American Library is an independent nonprofit institution. We're the largest English language lending library on the continent, and we are also 100 years old this year. So we've had an interesting centennial year so far. We've had to celebrate through confinement and into the age of social distancing, but we're very glad that you all have been, been with us at these virtual Zoom events and also at the library as we begin to cautiously reopen. Um, just a reminder that we are open for browsing for those of you who are local. So you're free to come and visit us and pick up any books that you'd like to take on vacation with you. You know, France calms down a bit in the months of July and August as many people head to their vacation destination. So feel free to visit us before you head off to yours. Um, I will, okay. I'll just go ahead and introduce Rob then. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Rob Murphy. He is joining us from Chicago, where he is the Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He is currently involved in research in diagnostics and treatment of COVID-19. In fact, he has been at the forefront of every infectious disease uh, global crisis since the AIDS pandemic in the 1980s. Um, so I'm sure his expertise will be invaluable in helping us meet this current challenge and also to appreciate the bigger picture of what we're experiencing. Um, I should also mention, since it's a very special fact, that Dr. Rob Murphy is a member of the American Library, so we're very, very glad to, to have an expert among us. And he also has experience with research in France. Um, he served as a professeur associé at Paris 6 um, at the Infectious Disease Unit of the Pitié Salpêtrière. And with that, I will turn it over. I've got to turn off the waiting room, Rob, and then I will appoint you as host. <laughs> okay. Just say what? Yeah, I'm not finding that right now. I'm so sorry. Just give me one more second. Okay, so now your host. There we go. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Murphy. So I'm also, as I mentioned, a member, and I also have lived in the CETIEM for, I have had an apartment there for 17 years, and I lived there full time in 2007 and 8. So it's nice to be back even virtually, because actually right now you probably realize that Americans are banned from coming to Europe. Uh, because of the situation with COVID-19 um, here in the United States. Um, so let's uh, just get into the, this uh, presentation. So I'm going to outline a little bit about the, the basic virology of uh, coronavirus-19. Um, and remember that corona, when you say COVID-19 or coronavirus-19, you're talking about the disease. The actual virus is SARS-CoV-2. So there's a little bit of a distinction between the disease, so kind of like HIV and AIDS. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology and local response, which are very different country to country. Uh, the interventions that have been used successfully and some not so successfully. The impact on healthcare systems and clinical research and social and biomedical engineering um, uh, approaches to designing the optimal uh, global health response. So coronaviruses have actually been around for quite a while. Uh, the first four that you see listed up here, the H uh, stands for human, human coronavirus, and then there's OC43, HKU1, NL63, Q29E. These cause about 15 to 20% of the common colds. Usually you don't even get a fever. They're contagious, but because they hardly cause any morbidity, very few people end up in the hospital, very few people die from them, very little attention was paid to them. So they were grossly understudied. 
Then along came severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. I'm sure everyone has heard of SARS. So that also was a coronavirus. And genetically, it's very similar to the common cold uh, coronaviruses. SARS is interesting in that uh, it's very severe. Uh, it didn't spread very far in the world, as I'll show you in another minute, uh, the, some data, but it had a mortality rate of 10%. Then it disappeared, just gone. And the second one, uh, then uh, another one called Mideast Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, appeared. Some of you may have not heard of that. It's limited strictly to the Middle East. It's still there. There have been little mini epidemics. Only a thousand or two people have been infected with MERS. But the difference is a 30% mortality rate. So not too many people infected, but 30% mortality. And then we've got SARS-CoV-2. That's the thing that's happening to us now. And the disease and what's reported is COVID. So these people have disease and they're diagnosed and they're confirmed. Now, epidemics are nothing new worldwide. I'm trained in infectious diseases and public health. Um, so I studied all these things for my whole career. I was a student until I was 35. I mean, actually, you never stop learning in the medical field because everything changes so much. But you can see up here, this is just the deaths, to, deaths, to put things in perspective. From COVID-19, these are the diagnosed confirmed cases. There's been some 579,000 deaths so far. Compared to HIV AIDS, there's been 32 million. The Hong Kong flu was a million. The Asian flu in the 50s was 2 million. And then the 2000, uh, the uh, 1918 flu killed 20 to 50 million and some people even think 100 million. Uh, so that was the last really major, huge one. But you, could, you go back in time and you can see there's been epidemics, you know, going back to the, the Black Death or the plague uh, in the mid 14th century, killed uh, one third of Europe, up to 200 million people. The Justinian era, 25 million people died from that. And the Antonine, the Galen uh, epidemic, which they don't even know what it was caused by, killed a quarter of the Roman Empire and led to its downfall. Now, if you just focus on viruses, um, that's what this uh, slide is about. And again, you'll see the, the deaths and the death rates. So for, um, uh, for SARS-CoV-2, um, the death rate you see there is 5.6% overall. But these are confirmed cases who are sick. If you look at all the people who are infected, it's more like about 1% to 1.3%. And then I already mentioned MERS at 30%, but not that many. SARS, the rate, original SARS, almost 10%. HIV originally was 100%, but now it's really zero if everybody takes their medicine, but they have to take the medicine. Ebola, I've, everyone's heard of Ebola, 25 to 90% mortality. Uh, and then a few other ones listed there, Hantavirus, Lassa fever, still a problem in Africa. Dengue, uh, many places in the world have dengue, including the Caribbean and subtropical areas. Rabies still kills 59,000 people per year. Influenza, influenza has been around since 6,000 BC, uh, and that still kills up to 650,000 people worldwide per year, about 0.1% of those infected in the United States anyway. Smallpox has been eradicated only in the 20th century, uh, however, in the 20th century alone, 300 million people died of smallpox, so a really very deadly disease. So what about the statistics as of today? This is actually from this morning, 13,355,992 reported cases with 579,000 deaths. The U.S. by far is leading the way with coronavirus, very unfortunate. 3.4 million cases, 136,000 deaths. Brazil right behind and will soon overtake the United States uh, because their approach to the disease is actually worse than the United States. India, cases are soaring, um, almost a million cases as of today. Russia right behind them with a tenth of the population. 
uh, it's a disaster. If you take the USA, Brazil, India, and Russia, that's about half the cases altogether um, in the world. And uh, they're these four countries are really driving the worldwide infection. Europe's a very different story, fortunately for you uh, in France. Um, UK, France, Germany, you see all kind of in the same sort of ballpark with the UK somewhat of an outlier. China, where the whole thing started, now we don't know if the report, how good the reporting is there, but they only have uh, 85,000 cases reported and 4,600 deaths. South Korea, where the reporting is very good, has very few cases, 13,512 with only 289 deaths. It's really, it's, uh, uh, South Korea is amazing. Uh, as, a, as a model. We can talk about that later. So here's uh, COVID in Europe. Um, the outside of China, this is where the infection first uh, left. Uh, the European countries are all kind of responding uh, about the same as you can see in the curve on the right. The UK is somewhat of an outlier. Uh, they're always kind of an outlier in these diseases. They have kind of a delayed uh, approach uh, to dealing with these kind of crises. Uh, they're coming down at the same kind of curve, but they're still above uh, the rest of the Europeans. Now, if you look at France, uh, this is as of yesterday. Uh, France really started getting uh, hit in uh, the beginning of March. And by the end of May, that big bubble that you see there is pretty much gone. Uh, and what you see now is just this trickle uh, of cases uh, that continues to, uh, to persist. But this is a good curve. We like this curve. Another way to look at the metrics uh, for uh, how bad things are is how much, how many people are requiring hospitalization. And you can see here in France that the number of cases has really gone down uh, to a trickle of those requiring hospitalization. So this is a very good uh, metric to follow in France. Now, if you look at the daily confirmed cases worldwide in the top red line here, um, and compare that to the different countries, you can see how the United States and Brazil are really the outliers here. France and South Korea, the, the number of cases are so small on the scale of this curve, you, you don't even actually, can't even see it. Uh, that's really how big the difference is uh, between these uh, different uh, parts of the world and how they've handled the infection. Now, let's talk a little bit about the stages of the disease. It turns out quite a few people, something around 40%, but maybe more, have no symptoms. Now, if you're asymptomatic, that is no symptoms, one of two things can happen. You can ultimately get symptoms that would be called pre-symptomatic, or you just never develop any symptoms. Many viral infections, many infections overall, a lot of people never get sick, uh, but they have the virus and uh, they can continue to spread the disease. You may have heard the case of typhoid Mary, the woman who had uh, no symptoms or anything but was spreading typhoid, a very famous uh, historical case. Same thing with uh, asymptomatic cases of COVID. It's very important to keep this in mind because this is why social distancing and using masks is so important because we can't tell by looking at somebody if they're contagious. Now then you have symptomatic disease. It turns out 85% of people that do get any symptoms have really very mild to moderate symptoms. They don't require hospitalization. There's no specific treatment at this time. Uh, that may change in the near future. But they go home, they're sick. They, they have, this is not like, uh, this can be quite seriously sick, but not requiring hospitalization. So that's symptomatic. 15% get hospitalized because they require oxygen. They've got full blown pneumonia, they need oxygen support, they need hospital support. So really a lot of it depends on how good the hospitals are where you are. France has very good hospitals, United States, pretty good hospitals too. Of those that go to the hospital, about 30% or so end up in the intensive care unit. And then usually once they get to the intensive care unit, or typically they'll require a ventilator uh, to keep breathing uh, well. Boris Johnson, 
you know, Prime Minister of the UK. He ended up in the ICU, but he didn't get ventilated. Um, it, but it did stop him from uh, kind of being a, a COVID denier. So that's good. And then deaths. If you make it, if you're in an ICU, the death rates range from 14 to 80 percent. And a lot of that is related to the experience of the particular hospital in treating this. So the 14% is actually my own hospital here at Northwestern University in Chicago. We have a top-notch uh, critical care unit. We have a lot of experience with this. Our rate on every population group was really low for ICU admissions, and even those on ventilators. Uh, three weeks ago, you may have read that we actually did a double lung transplant, the first lung transplant in COVID-19. Lungs completely destroyed from the pneumonia. And everybody talks about how age is such an important factor. The person who got the double lung transplant was a 21 year old woman. Uh, so young people can certainly get sick. So if you look at the figure that's embedded in this slide, you look at hospitalizations in the light blue, the medium blue is ICU and death. Uh, you can see it is proportional, the death rate anyway in the, in the ICU rate is proportional to the age. However, the hospitalization rate is pretty much the same, uh, even more so in the, uh, in the younger uh, patients because more of them are getting infected now, especially now. Uh, so this whole thing about the young people don't get sick and everything, that's really just absolutely not true. They get sick. Uh, and if you are sick enough to be in a hospital, that means you're hypoxic, you're not getting enough oxygen. And you can have a lot of problems from not having oxygen to the brain, to the heart, to the other organ systems, and all of them can be impacted. Clinically, um, what happens when somebody's infected, just like most other viral infections that we know of, is fever. Almost everybody infected with COVID has a fever. So if you're sick, you have some sniffles or something like that, uh, if you don't have a fever, it pretty much goes against having COVID. Now, should you be tested? Mm -hmm. It depends. It depends what you've been doing. Have you been around anybody at high risk? You're just unsure, then you get tested. The other symptoms are very typical of any kind of viral infection. Fatigue, a dry cough, loss of appetite is anorexia, myalgias, muscle aches, dyspnea means shortness of breath, sputum production, coughing up phlegm, and a rash. And you can see the pictures over on the side there are the, especially in the toes. We don't understand why this is other than the fact that the toes are the farthest away in the body and maybe you're not getting uh, or enough oxygen down there. Uh, but they have the typical toe rash. It's really kind of strange. And then one unique feature compared to many other viral diseases and respiratory infections is a loss of smell. That's not typically a question we ask somebody when they come in the hospital. Can you smell okay? Is your taste okay? However, if you look for it, you find it. And if you actually look for it, about two thirds of patients will have a loss of smell. So that's a very bad sign for COVID. If somebody comes in, they have a fever and they can't smell right, that's COVID. Now, you've probably all heard about the different risks. Age is the one that keeps getting repeated over and over. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, not only are you at risk for getting COVID, but you're at risk for dying based on your age. And you can see these are data from the United States, but they're really pretty much repeated uh, everywhere around the world. Now, even if you're 85 and you get COVID, still it's a third of the patients are dying from the disease, but it's not 100%. So there's plenty of older people uh, can get infected and do fine. Um, Living in a nursing, so age is one thing. Living in a confined uh, situation, like a nursing home or some kind of care facility is a risk. Um, prisoners in jails, uh, some of them are rampant with this. Uh, that can be cleaned up, we know how to do that. The number one disease associated with bad outcome is diabetes. Uh, diabetes is also a small vessel disease. And one of the things we're learning about COVID is that it does affect the vascular system in the body. So the combination of diabetes uh, and, the, and, uh, and COVID is, is not a good combination. Any kind of underlying lung disease like asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic bronchitis, all bad. Any serious heart condition. 
We, at the beginning of this thing, we thought that the virus attacked the heart. Actually, it turns out that's not true. What the problem with uh, serious heart disease is, is with the low oxygenation due to the pneumonia. And that affects the brain and also the heart in an adverse way. Same thing with the kidneys. Anybody with underlying blood disorders, any kind of hematologic malignancy, very high risk here. Any immunocompromised patient, that means anybody with cancer, anybody with chronic HIV, any kind of underlying rheumatologic diseases, anybody with liver disease, and also anybody with obesity, particularly severe obesity. These are all big risks uh, for doing bad on COVID disease. Matter of fact, if you come into the emergency room and you have COVID, uh, and you don't need oxygen, you'll probably go home. But if you have one or more of these risk factors, you'll be admitted most likely. So if you look at hospitalization, ICU, and death, like I, it's actually embedded in that other slide, I wanted to uh, highlight it here. The reason why this is such a, COVID is such a strain on the medical system is that all these hospitalizations and ICU admissions are in addition to everything that is typically going on in a hospital. And so the hospital system actually gets overwhelmed with these patients. And hospitals, hospitals are expensive. So there's not a lot of um, uh, leeway. There's not a lot of uh, uh, extra space in the hospital system to handle a pandemic. That's one thing we've really learned uh, about this. However, by the time it takes, if you try to build an emergency hospital, like China did a 10,000 person hospital, they built it in a week, okay? We converted McCormick Place, the big uh, conference center in Chicago into a hospital. By the time it was done, 2,000 beds, fully, fully functional hospital, only 36 patients had to go there. So we wasted a lot of money, but we were prepared. Here's what it looks like, <clears throat> and the stress on the system. In the red dash line that you see going horizontal there, um, that's basically the capacity. When you see COVID increase the need for ICU beds and uh, hospitalizations, you can see it's just, it can overwhelm the hospital systems. And uh, that really is what the crisis was, particularly in the heavy hit cities like New York early on. Uh, New York, by the way, has really cleaned up. Their, they're more like Europe right now. Uh, whereas Florida, Georgia, uh, Arizona, uh, even Southern California, again, are completely going in the wrong direction. And right now they're reporting that ICU capacity and hospital capacity is at 100% in many places. So this is what happens. The health system actually can implode if you don't take care of it. Now, how do we deal with this? Well, we really have two approaches, social engineering, and biomedical engineering. Uh, we can take uh, either, either one of these, probably we have to do both actually. So social distancing is nothing new. In the influenza epidemic of 1918, Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States, did exactly what President Trump did and basically ignored the whole epidemic. He left it up to the cities, the states, anybody else that wanted to do anything. He didn't even mention it. It's really incredible. So the cities all took different approaches. Philadelphia had one of those uh, laissez-faire type approaches. They were having parades. You know, the men were coming back from the Great War. There was just all this stuff going on. The bars were open. St. Louis, on the other hand, had a little bit more of a public health approach and closed all the bars, banned all the gatherings, including all the parades. And you can see what happened here. The number of deaths per 100,000 population skyrocketed in Philadelphia. Uh, it went up in St. Louis, but not nearly at the rate that happened in Philadelphia. And this was true through the United States. You can see the, the more intense social distancing and, and uh, stopping the gatherings and stuff like that uh, had a, uh, a big effect on the number of um, cases and hospital use. After the epidemic was gone, which took two years, uh, if you look at the economic recovery, this may be a little bit confusing here, but the longer uh, that you uh, had the social distancing in place, economically, the better 
the cities did. If you can compare like Cleveland to Pittsburgh, or Minneapolis to St. Paul, even two cities that are attached to each other, there were different approaches. So the recovery, the economic recovery is better in the places that do the social distancing, which is the opposite of what is happening in the United States where they say, oh, you're ruining the economy because of the social distancing. It's actually in the long run, the opposite is true. Here's the impact. This is modeling from the UK. Um, if you just social distance for a short period of time, um, you can see that their model there shows that 128 million total infections would happen. Uh, and if you do it for two months, it's only 14 million. That's an enormous difference in terms of the impact on the healthcare system and overall survival. So how do we stop this thing from spreading? So 94% of the transmission is person to person, uh, which is typically respiratory droplets. And respiratory droplets can be contained in any one of these three kinds of masks that you see here. The top is an N95 mask, which is very difficult to breathe and you can't understand anybody when they're wearing one of these. Uh, it's really recommended more for people in the hospital. And we don't recommend people just walk around with that. But it does protect you a little bit from getting it and also from giving it. The blue one in the middle is the typical surgical mask. Uh, it, does, it doesn't fit that tightly. So you're not really so much protected from getting it, but you're, you will stop getting those respiratory droplets out. And then the cloth masks that you see at the bottom that now come in all these pretty colors and everything, uh, also, they're pretty good. They do uh, prevent you from spreading it to other people. Only 6% of cases are from the environment. So it's important to clean things down, but fortunately, coronavirus is a very fragile virus. Soap and water kills it. 60% uh, alcohol solutions, any kind of disinfectant, uh, the only disinfectant that doesn't work is actually vinegar solutions, which uh, are not strong enough. But that's about the only one. It's easy to disinfect. So we're only seeing about 6% of the infections um, coming from the environment. Um, staying three to six weeks, six feet away from people limits the risk of transmission by up to 85%. Just three feet, one meter away from people. Uh, and if you go to six feet, that uh, the... Um, Decrease in transmission goes 50% better. Uh, the mask we talked about, uh, high risk activities in terms of, of uh, uh, contact with people, singing, shouting, coughing, sneezing, um, grunting, like the sports people, you know, they're grunting when they're doing whatever the sport is. Those are all high risk. There's been lots of epidemics associated with choirs practicing and shouting matches and stuff like that. So lower risk also includes being outside where there's good ventilation and sunshine. Ultraviolet also kills the virus. Being in a very well ventilated room if you're inside, uh, especially if there's fresh air able to come in, windows are open. Wash your hands frequently. Uh, wash uh, potentially infected surfaces, like I said. And get in the habit of not touching your face, because if you do get it on your hand, you still have to get it into your face. So here's a couple of social distancing uh, techniques. In the United States, we have, I don't know if you have it in France there, but we have all these circles everywhere. And you're, when you're at the store, you're supposed to stand in a circle and not get in between. The uh, French, uh, this was a picture I just found on the internet and some of the outdoor cafes, they put these big teddy bears in the chairs to keep people apart. I thought that was a very clever social distancing. So there are ways to social distance and it can be done successfully. Here's Florida. Um, this is taken just a couple days ago. Uh, there's nobody wearing a mask. There's nobody even making an attempt to stay three feet away from another person. And guess what? They have more cases in Florida than all of Europe combined on a daily basis. Uh, and it's uh, completely out of control. They are now, if they were a country, they would be the number eight on the whole COVID list. Florida is a complete disaster. If you're thinking of going to Florida at any time in the next year, forget it. This place is, is a hotbed that's only getting worse. So, Options to control of COVID. Social distancing and masks doesn't work in the US, but it works everywhere else. Uh, just because the people in the US have politicized it and they won't do it. Uh, wait for a vaccine. There's 14 vaccines in human trials now and 200 in development overall. Wait for better treatment. 
Uh, the treatment is only given dexamethasone, uh, remdesivir, and tocilizumab only in late stage disease. We need something that you get diagnosed, you take it, so you don't get sick. Uh, and test, 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 and quarantine. And the capacity we have in the U.S. with all the cases that we have, we can't keep up with it. And then there's the group that think we should just do nothing and let it run its course, like the Brazilians are doing, and that's going to kill millions of people. Are you willing to sacrifice five uh, percent of the population just just for this? It's just amazing. In the United States, we've uh, started this thing called Operation Warp Speed. This is the, to move the vaccine uh, ahead faster. Um, the little arrow in the middle is uh, Francis Collins, head of the National Institutes for Health, and that's uh, the one on the left is um, Bruce Tromberg, who's head of uh, the National Institutes for Biomedical Engineering. Uh, they're all very, these are doctors here, so they're social distancing, where the rest of the White House doesn't really do it. But anyhow, they're pumping in billions of dollars into the development of these vaccines. Moderna is the one that's the furthest ahead uh, with the RNA vaccine. Uh, they got 500 million, that's this, um, 500, it's actually $500 million, not $1,000, so I have to correct that. $500 million to actually make the vaccine, not even knowing if it's gonna work. So they've treated 45 patients so far. It looks like it works in those 45, but ultimately they'll treat 30,000 by the end of the year and make a billion miles of vaccine by December 31st. So these vaccines are gonna come up very quickly. So the best way forward, everything is doable. Social distancing as much as possible for as long as necessary. Wear masks when in public places, public places. Keep schools and universities closed in the high endemic areas, uh, like in the southern part of the United States. Uh, now we, they should not open. We have to continue to support the unemployed. Uh, you know, this is not so easy in the United States because we don't have the social safety net that the Europeans have. Uh, we have to continue to ramp up testing, like the South Koreans who've really been able to control this thing from the beginning. Get the supplies out there. We're still behind in the supply capacity, although it's better. Uh, enforce public health policy vigilantly. It seems like the Europeans are doing much better than the Americans. The massive vaccine development initiative, as I just mentioned, drug development programs, and uh, we actually had a pandemic response team, but it was disbanded in the uh, early days of the Trump administration. So we need to get that going again and internationalize it. And um, the more forceful we, we act now, uh, the shorter the problem. So I, these people uh, help me uh, with some of these uh, slides here and I thank you and can take some questions now. Thank you so much for your presentation, Rob. That was fantastic and informative. And we do indeed have questions already flooding in. Um, so I'll so. stop share. OK, okay. perfect. And I'll let you, can you control it now? Or? Yeah, I'll go ahead and reclaim the host. Um, OK, perfect. Um, you got it? Yep, I do. Thank you. Okay. OK, so now is the time, if you have any questions, to please submit them via the chat feature. And I'll do my best to get to as many as possible. <laughs> Thank okay. you again, Rob, also, for your presentation. <laughs> okay. All right. So the first one is about testing. Yes. Should young children, toddlers, infants, et cetera, get tested even with mild symptoms or wait to see if the parents develop symptoms? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it depends where you are and what's going on. I think a kid uh, with, uh, the kids are also handling this much different. They don't have as many symptoms. They don't have as much fever. Plus kids get everything. They're like Petri dishes, especially at the daycare center. I think you, can, you have to use a little common sense here. If there are no cases in your particular city or region or neighborhood, uh, you could probably give it a little slack. But if there are cases popping up that you know of, you can get tested. The testing now is readily available, especially in France, it's easy for you guys to get it. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a second part to this question. So um, this may affect many of us in the group. So I'll go ahead and get to it. If those of us who can travel to and from the US still, uh, well, would you recommend that they are tested before seeing family in addition to social distancing measures? Well, you coming from France are not the problem. It's you going back home, back to your French home. That's the problem. 
the America, it's all over here. When, if, you, if you've been here lately, there, people are not wearing masks. It's not a federal law. It's not even a state law in most places, although Texas actually just put one in place. So uh, some of the places are changing because the thing is so out of control. So I'd say coming from France, I don't think you have to get tested because you hardly have any cases now. The risk is the other direction. And they're, they're, that's why they're not letting Americans uh, into Europe. So you got to be careful with American passport coming into France. I'm not sure actually how that will work at immigration now. They may make you quarantine for 14 days. We okay. in Chicago, we make people coming from the hot states quarantine for 14 days. If you come to Chicago, you have to quarantine. It's it's not enforced really, but that law is on the books. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Um, also, while traveling, especially during transatlantic flights, would wearing a visor while drinking or eating help? Uh, you mean the face shield, the plastic? Yeah, shield. I think that's what she means. Yes. Um, they're a little bit uncomfortable on an airplane because everything's <laughs> kind of tight and everything, and then you know you have to get it under the shield. Any kind of barrier is helpful. So a mask, a shield, whatever you can do that you're comfortable with, at a minimum a mask. But if you can do the shield too, that's even better. Okay, thank you for the next question. Um, this is someone who has mild asthma and has had bronchi bronchitis tw twice in the past two years. Um, her boyfriend uh, is sending his son back to daycare um, where they aren't using any masks or any gel. So she's is limiting her- Is or the US? This is within France, Paris okay. area. Okay. So she's limiting her exposure to the boyfriend because the child is in daycare. Um, mm -hmm. Is she being overly cautious? No, and, she's not being overly cautious okay. because the people with asthma have a very tough time if they get sick. She's not being overly cautious. That's a good right. idea. Yeah, and then she's just expressing concerns about schools opening in the fall and how long we'll have to continue this, this sort of uh, well, behavior. Well, again, yeah. the, the way the French have handled this is so much better that they have so few cases that if they get a case, they can do all the contact tracing and, and quarantining immediately. How can you do contact tracing, even in Chicago, which is not a high city, how can you possibly do contact tracing on a thousand people per day? It's, it's just not possible. Right, thank you. Um, the next question, you mentioned hospitalized patients often have pneumonia. Uh, does the pneumonia shot provide some protection? No. The pneumonia shot is for bacterial pneumonia. We've actually looked at this very closely to see, like with influenza, you get the flu, you can get a pneumonia, and then you are very high risk for bacterial pneumonia. In that case, the pneumonia shot helps. With coronavirus, we've looked very closely, and it's like less than one or 2% get a concomitant bacterial infection. So this thing, this coronavirus really just takes over the whole lung. There's no room for any other pathogen to get in there. Right. Okay. We have a pneumonia vaccine anyway, though. <laughs> yeah, we all have to do our work this fall, I think. Okay. What? Why is the mortality rate in Germany lower than France and the UK? Oh yeah, that's a that's a good question. I'm in this uh, group called uh, Project 2025, uh, run by the American Council on Germany, and we talk about this uh, quite a bit. I gave a version of this presentation. The Germans, they th think that uh, their approach had been very centralized from the beginning, uh, that they also have in their medical system a built-in capacity. Uh, they have a thicker, they have a, a bigger uh, capacity cushion in their hospitals. Uh, for instance, they have hospitals kind of uh, in different areas where it, to be more cost-effective, they've been closed in other countries. Whereas the Germans have decided the hospital is an important structure in all these cities and neighborhoods. So they won't close it just because it's half full or half empty, whatever, you know. So they have the capacity. They jumped on it right at the beginning. Also, the first group of Germans that got infected were relatively young. They were coming back from a skiing trip. And so the first group of patients in Germany that got infected were younger, whereas the, the group in Italy, I'm not sure about France, but I think France too and Spain, and definitely the United States, were elderly people uh, in uh, confined facilities, nursing homes in particular. At the beginning of the epidemic in the US, it, almost half the patients 
who were dying were from nursing homes. So uh, it, just the whole epidemiology is different, the treatment was different, and their approach was stronger at the beginning, so it paid off for them. And the UK was the opposite. They, did, they ignored it for a long time, and now they're still playing catch-up. Remember Boris Johnson, the comments he used to make? You know, he didn't shut up till he ended up in the ICU. Now we don't hear him commenting. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. All right, so you mentioned singing and shouting as high risk. Uh, where does talking fall in terms of risk? And this person's talking thinking of an office a, setting or a school setting specifically. Talking at a normal um, rate, uh, three feet is enough. One meter distance is probably enough. The problem when you sing, you're taking deep breaths, you're shouting, you can, those droplets can go eight, 10 feet. Where it's just talking is less than three feet. Okay, the next question is asking for a little bit of advice on kids in sports. So this is somebody who is wanting to make sure that her son remains active. She signed him up for baseball, but she's nervous that it's a high risk activity. She's also worried about mental health risk and the importance of sports in a healthy life. Yep. What is your opinion? Uh, I think sports is a good thing. Uh, I think, I mean, I think it's good. It's a healthy thing for children uh, to be engaged in sports. You, we had the case in Lake Zurich, uh, which is a suburb of Chicago, just this week, where 200 kids at a, a sports summer camp thing have gotten infected. It's a disaster up there uh, because they bring it home. They get the relatives and parents and everybody can get sick from that. Um, so it's a big problem. So what they're doing with the, um, here the, in the US, the universities in particular that have really kind of a lot of economics in their profession, in their uh, college sports, they test all the players periodically. They have their own testing service for the athletes that go in and get tested. Now every public school or school, school in anywhere, France or the US, are they gonna have the resources to do that? Do they have to do it? Again, it depends on how much infection is in your particular neighborhood. Now, if they find out a kid in the school is infected or a kid on the team, everything has to stop. And everybody then has to get tested. So uh, you have to mix the public health in uh, with the risk. But uh, I'm not sure in a place as, as low risk as France's, uh, I don't think they're gonna start screening every kid at school. They're talking about doing it here. Um, and they're really, but we don't have that. We still don't even have the testing capacity in the United States yet. So we're actually trying to ramp up the testing capacity. Right. Getting a lot of questions about the vaccine. So I'll see if I can combine oh. a couple. Um, so what do you think about the vaccine? If and when will it be available? We have another, will the vaccine be available by winter? So vaccines yeah. are, the technology in vaccines has really improved uh, dramatically. So there's over 200 um, in development right now worldwide. Everybody's making a vaccine. There's like seven different ways to make a vaccine. So there's all these different technologies out there. 14 of the vaccines are in human trials as we speak. Moderna that I mentioned in the presentation is just the first one. The Oxford one is right behind that, uh, the, ad, uh, the adenovirus vector one. Uh, so they're, they're different, they have different approaches, they probably have different safety profiles and they probably have different efficacy profiles. So we'll see. So the Moderna one um, and, and the Oxford one are doing the same thing. They're getting money to develop their manufacturing capacity after they've only treated basically fewer than 100 patients. In the real world, this never, you would never put in hundreds of millions of dollars to build a vaccine facility, manufacturing facility at, at that stage. It just never happens. But now we are doing it because it is a pandemic. And so what they're doing is they're just gambling that if this works, then when the phase three study is done in December, the vaccine will go out the door. It won't take another year to ramp up the manufacturing capacity, which is typically what would happen. So that's the gamble. And they realize that putting a couple hundred million dollars into a manufacturing facility, if the vaccine doesn't work, it's just, it's gone. But it, this is the insurance. So 
all of the, there's been some estimates of the top seven vaccine candidates. Um, the, the estimate, just based on not knowing about any particular technology, but just in the overall, the way this approaches, that only two of those vaccines will actually go forward of the first seven, even though each is getting hundreds of millions of dollars to ramp up manufacturing um, before it's even studied. Because you're going from 50 pa 45 patients with the Moderna trial to 30,000 by December. So a lot can happen between 50 patients and 30,000 patients. We'll know how effective it is. We'll know if it's toxic. You know, the Moderna vaccine is an RNA vaccine. First time this type of vaccine has been used in humans. You know, you've got to make sure if you're going to give billions of doses, this thing better be safe. All right, the next question is, how do you suggest dealing with people not compliant with wearing masks and keeping social distance, socially distant? Well, this is, uh, uh, I don't know what's happening in France, although there was somebody, a bus driver was murdered. Yeah. In the Basque country, I think. Uh, so apparently this is an issue there too. Here, it's a, it's a very political issue. There are people that get shunned who are wear masks, and there are people that get shunned who don't wear masks. It just depends what you're, there's no reason for politics here. This virus is an equal opportunity killer, has, doesn't care who you are. The virus doesn't have a brain. There's no brain in the virus. It's just this little organism. It's gonna affect everybody. So what can an individual do? I mean, you can just avoid that person. I mean, you know, when you walk down the street here, uh, in Lincoln Park in Chicago, you know, if I see somebody coming toward me without a mask, I just I try to move as far away from that person. I, I want to stay at least three feet away from them and don't talk with them. Mm -hmm. People get the idea that you don't want to be around them. But the best way to do the, uh, the mask issue is to mandate that they be worn and that there's penalties if you do not wear it. And it has to be a law that's enforced. That's the only way that uh, you can deal with it. Individually, it's, it's not going to work because people have made up their own mind, ignorant or not, that they're not gonna wear a mask. You can say, what are you gonna have a conversation with them? They'll probably start shouting and then it's even a higher risk. <laughs> right. But it has to be a law and it has to be an enforceable law. And it can't be too punitive, but uh, it, uh, there needs to be some um, uh, uh, recourse, uh, not recourse, uh, there has to be something that you pay. Uh, if you don't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. So we do have someone joining us from Florida um, and they're wondering oh. if you have any extra recommendations for staying safe in that state. Uh, I would actually, if I were, uh, if I had, were in Florida and had to live there right now, I would uh, upgrade myself to the N95 mask uh, because that does give you more protection on the coming into you. Uh, N95 masks you can buy at hardware stores. Uh, there's a hospital grade and an industrial grade, like a lot of contractors and stuff will use an N95 mask um, because it's for fumes and all the stuff uh, that they're working with in construction. Those masks are, are perfectly good. Uh, also, the N95 is the same uh, category of protection as the hospital grade, and they are approved actually in the United States. So I would do that and just, I would be sheltering in place if I were in Florida now, only going out when absolutely essential, having things delivered, um, because it's a real, Florida is, is the epicenter of the epidemic in the world right now. Um, and it doesn't, nothing seems to be happening in the right direction. I, I feel sorry for anyone living in Florida. Right. So is it safe to swim in a pool? Um... A club pool specifically. I guess maybe an indoor pool is what the question is. Club pool, indoor, outdoors. The virus uh, doesn't like water. So it's not waterborne. It's not spread in the water. So the fact that you're in water is nothing. I think the issue is being close to other people in the water. You know, you can't be packed in there because you're still going to be getting infected from the people uh, through the, the person. So the water doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just a person-to-person -person contact. If you could stay one to two meters away from people in a pool, it should be fine. Okay. So this might be related to the vaccine question, but again, how long do you think we will be socially, social distancing and wearing masks? Well, until 
the coronavirus burns out and goes away on its own. SARS went away. You know, other epidemics do go away. Um, when we get the vaccine, the people, that, and we prove that it's effective, if you have the vaccine, it's gone for those that have taken the vaccine. Now, that you, it brings up the issue of herd immunity. I don't know if you've heard that term. Mm -hmm. So typically, with the, when you put a vaccine in the population and you protect, let's just, I'm just picking a number because I don't know what it is with coronavirus, say 70%. If 70% of the people have protective antibody against the virus, the virus is going to have to find those three people that are not, not protected by the vaccine. So if somebody has it, you know, is there really enough people around them to keep the whole thing spreading? So every disease, depending on the infectivity, has a, a herd percentage that is required. So one of the uh, most contagious uh, uh, viral infections is measles. So if it, it, so what's happened in the United States and, and actually in Europe too, places people that are uh, anti-vaccine people and they have not given their children uh, the measles vaccine. Um, you know, when that level drops below 90%, you start seeing many epidemics of measles, which can also kill you by the way. So uh, it, it, that's the herd immunity. So we don't know where that number is with coronavirus, but that's what it's gonna take to extinguish this thing. Okay, thank you. And we'll just have time for maybe two or three more questions. I'm doing my best here. So, um, oh, what do, we, what do we know about the harmful effects and complications after someone has had COVID-19? Blood clots, lung damage, can yeah, you elaborate on this? No, we're, uh, we're still really learning about this disease. There were several articles uh, in the past week on neurologic complications uh, of the disease. So, even people who are asymptomatic have abnormal uh, brain scans. Uh, so we don't really know. Um, but, you know, there's a group that get the blood clots. Uh, and the um, last week, there were reports from several autopsy series. And the, the pathologists were saying there are blood clots everywhere. So they're in the brain, they're in the kidney, they're in the lung, literally blood clots are, are everywhere. Um, so there's a, we, we're learning more about these complications. And so I can't really answer the question, but there are gonna be long-term complications on this, that's for sure. You, this is not a disease that just goes away and you have, there's no complication. It's not the common cold. Okay, the next question is, what are we doing about the other animal viruses? Do you have any updates oh. there? <laughs> Very broad. Is the, um, right, like what's next? Like why are we getting all these epidemics? You know, right. We had all those other ones were spread apart by a couple hundred years. Now all of a sudden, you know, mm -hmm. HIV, SARS, MERS, where did all this come from? It, it comes from the animal reservoirs and it comes from when people increase in the population and spread and the animals and the people interact. So this one probably came from animals in a market, a 10,000 person market, by the way, this is like a massive market. So probably spread there and the animals can go, you know, the viruses can go back and forth between the animals and humans. And not every, every virus in an animal can make a human sick. However, they, it's called jump species. Can they jump, can they mutate and actually infect that person? And the answer is yes. It happened with HIV. It happened with SARS-CoV-2. It happens with influenza. Uh, so uh, the jumping back and forth from the animals, and the reason is overpopulation, climate change, in other words, where the animals and everything are moving uh, as the planet warms up, uh, and, the, and the interaction between uh, humans moving into the animal habitat. Same thing with Ebola. Okay, great. And for our final question, is the potential there to eliminate this disease like smallpox or just to limit it like influenza? Well, is this going to be a chronic endemic uh, condition is what you're saying? Um, well, that's a good question too. I think like the other SARS viruses, I think it's going to go away. I think there'll be, you know, how many billion people are we going to have to vaccinate to get rid of it? 
but I think it can, I think it can, I think this SARS-CoV-2 can go away. However, remember, SARS-CoV-2 is 70% related to SARS, which is 70% related to MERS, which is 70% related to the common cold coronaviruses. Why can't there be uh, uh, SARS-CoV-3? You know, so uh, the good thing is, is that the work we do on these RNA viruses is going to pay off when the next epidemic comes. We'll be much more prepared. And I didn't have time to talk about it, but that's why Vietnam, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong are actually doing so well with SARS-CoV-2. They lived through SARS. You know, it was a nightmare for them. And they the culturally are not afraid to use a mask. Matter of fact, you hardly see anybody without a mask uh, in those parts of Asia. And so their behavior, their uh, public health approach, um, and their their experience with former epidemics prepared them better for this one than us. Okay, thank you so much, Rob. Well, that's all the time we have. So thank you again for your presentation, for answering our questions, and thank you to our audience for submitting so many wonderful questions. I hope this has been helpful to everybody. I hope to see you all in Paris one of these days when they start letting us back. Yeah, we'll have to all get together once once you're back in Paris. That sounds fantastic. Um, I did want to mention again that the American Library is a nonprofit, and normally in our in-person events, we welcome donations of 10 euros. I did send around a link um, giving you the option to donate online if you'd like to support the library, if you enjoyed this event. So please do click if you'd like to support. Um, otherwise, this is our last event of the season. So we'll be breaking here for about six weeks, but I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back in September. We've got, I'll just preview two events very quickly for you. On September 1st, we have Holly Clayson, who will be speaking on 19th century lighting technologies and their effect on impressionist paintings. And on September 2nd, we will welcome Greg Garrett, who's going to speak to us on the history of portrayals of race and racism in film. So thank you all. Thank you again, Rob. My pleasure. And everybody stay safe and take care. And uh, we hope to see you back here in September on in Zoom, I guess, for the time being. And we'll welcome you back as soon as we can in person. All right, take care.